Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Meeting Place. I'm your host, Jonathan Colleton. Some of you might know me uh, from my role in the Department of Student Life at UTSC, where I'm the Campus Life and Special Events Coordinator. I work with clubs and student societies, so when you have to go to a workshop to learn about club funding or you have questions about conflict management within your club, I'm the guy you talk to. So what is The Meeting Place all about? Well, since everyone is cooped up at home trying to self-isolate, we wanted to create a way for people to stay connected. So I'll be interviewing staff from UTSC about their role and how they help students, and I'm also going to talk to students about the experiences they've had over the years at UTSC. Now, as we get this podcast off the ground, uh, expect some technical difficulties. Since we're self-isolating, everyone I'm interviewing is doing the interview online from their own homes. We're using apps like Skype or Zoom or some other type of online meeting platform. So there's definitely going to be some times where our internet connections aren't perfect and the audio gets a little choppy. Also, I've never recorded a podcast before, so expect some mistakes like leaving the ringer on my phone on during my first interview. Uh, So listen for that. But hey, we'll live and learn. And as we record more episodes, hopefully we'll figure this thing out. So with that said, let's get to the first episode. My first guest on the podcast is Rebecca Nyswander, who is our coordinator of first year programs at UTSC. She's going to talk to us about her passion for student access, as well as uh, helping students navigate the hidden curriculum of university. And we're also going to talk about her new puppy, Buddy, who she gets to spend all day with right now while she's working from home. Here is my interview with Rebecca. So, Rebecca, tell me about your job at UTSC. What do you do day to day? What program do you run for students? So I do everything first year. Um, I guess technically my name is coordinator or my title is coordinator first year programs. Um, And really what that entails is I oversee all of our first year transition programs. Um, So our first year experience program, which includes our first year advising team, Uh, the first year learning communities program, which is a biweekly program for students from different programs of study to meet with each other. Um, and, uh, and we run large scale and medium scale events throughout the year to support students transition, like exam jam or first year cafe. Uh, and they ask me both. Okay. So with that many different programs, you obviously have a bunch of different work study students who, who help out running those programs, I imagine. Oh yeah. Um, we have a team of about 25 students, which is like compared to, I'd say some, uh, some of the other portfolios, uh, a larger team. Um, yeah, you actually might employ the most work studies on campus, probably out of any staff. Yeah, probably. I mean, I, so my previous work experience, I worked on RES um, or the at UTSC, so the, the Student Housing and Resident System. And when I was working there, we had 33 students who worked on residence. Um, but uh, they weren't work studies. So right, yeah. That's, technically, that's yeah. <laughs> but I did supervise all 33. So. Right, 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 right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Makes uh, uh, for one-on-ones complicated. <laughs> yeah, I imagine so. And so, um, you know, with the programming you do, do you find it very cyclical? Does it kind of reset every year? Um, are there different things that happen during different months, or is it ongoing, or how does that work? I think generally speaking, the formula is about the same. Like, you know, first year students come in, first year students need help acclimating. Um, we support that. But I would say year to year, uh, I don't know, it's funny because I, I think as an individual, I'm like, how do I like crack the code where like I can make my work easier and, um, you know, do the same thing all the time. But every year it just doesn't work that way. Right. You know, depending on the, yeah. even like your team, like your, your student, your, your work study team is going to come with different ideas. They're going to have like their own like identity as a team, which will impact the work that they do. Um, but really like, like the student body coming in is so different year to year, right? Whether that's from like a demographics perspective, depending on how many students you have from different regions or, or whatnot. But even, I mean, I think I, pro- I started working or like developing first year programs about 10 years ago. Um, and I would say like the type of programming that I did then wouldn't necessarily fit the type of program that we're doing now. Yeah. Um, so I, I think, and, and I think that also speaks to like, as an individual, I, I value development. So every year I want to be critical of the things that we've done. How do we improve? Um, how do we make our programs better? But really also being relevant. I, you know, I remember yeah. being a student and feeling like some of the things weren't super relevant. Like it was clear that some of the staff were 
distant from my own experience. So I think it's, it's, it's something we want to be cognizant of. You know, I always think about that. Like we probably have about 13,000 undergrad students who are on, a, on our campus every year. And every five years, probably 95% of those students have left and we've got another 13,000 students. So mm -hmm. we have to figure out how to, what programming needs to exist for them, right? Like think yeah. back to when you and me started university, Facebook was barely a thing. And then by the yeah. end of university, that was the way you promoted everything. Yeah, 100%. You've got to adapt for that all the time. Uh, yeah. So what would you say are the program objectives um, for your portfolio? And what would be the main benefit that students would get when they get involved in that programming? Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, the, really what we hope to accomplish with our program is we hope to, like, I, if you read the description for this podcast, um, one of the things that we aim to do is to help students navigate the hidden curriculum uh, mm -hmm. of university. So, I mean, there's one component of, like, we want to help students transition to university, and that doesn't mean that it's going to be totally seamless, there aren't going to be challenges because that's just how life works, right? Like, yeah. you know, you're going to experience challenges and some of your most important moments are going to be difficult, right? And your best mm -hmm. learning experiences come from difficulty. So certainly don't want to say that that, like we're eradicating difficulty, um, but our hope is like, it is, is to help you in like navigating resources and understanding what you can utilize in ter like in terms of like navigating those difficulties because first year is hard and maybe I'm biased because it was one of the worst years of my life sure. um, and maybe that's why I do this now um, but it like it's hard and uh, and I think for myself if I had really understood everything that was available that would have made a difference and and to be honest like I had a roommate who just who was really my first year <laughs> coordinator first year programs because she helped me na navigate and figure out everything worked um like i'm a mm -hmm. my, i'm a first generation student i didn't understand how anything worked I, I moved into residence because i i kept i always overslept in high school and so i was like i should live on campus so like you know like yeah, and yeah. like and so i'm not late for classes and i remember moving into residence and one i, I brought way too many things i didn't right. realize that they often that had a virtual the tour yeah yeah or yeah. like that they even offered i didn't even realize they'd have a lock on the door I was oh, like, oh, wow. good, there's a lock on the door. Did they give you um, a packing list? They told you what stuff to bring or no? I, I'm sure they did. Um, <laughs> you know, back in the day, UT email was like an archaic interface that oh, like, yeah. you, like I think you couldn't even activate till day one. So it was, yeah, it went mail. It was yeah, so Yeah, web mail is rough. It's, uh, yeah, it was terrible. So I, I'm sure they sent me something. Um, but And I think also my parents were coping with the fact that they were like, oh my gosh, she's leaving. Why is she leaving? And um, I think their coping mechanism was <laughs> buying everything that I needed in order to set me up for success yes. in my new apartment. But I remember even like, I moved in. That. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Parents can be helpful for that, but also uh, maybe just a little too much sometimes. Yeah, man, I, I didn't need nearly all that stuff, but my roommates liked it. So, <laughs> uh, but I remember moving into residence and then, um, you know, typically when you live on res, you have, um, you live in a community and you have a residence advisor or Don supports you yeah. and mine was you know Sean the Don and he came to my door and he introduced himself on day one and I was like and I had a great conversation he walked away and my and I was like my parents and I just looked at each other like who is this guy and I'm like I don't really understand I think he <laughs> lives on my floor and now we're friends um and like I got a noise complaint once and like a, a residence advisor showed up I'm like I don't understand why you're in my room, but okay. Um, and then I think when I applied to be a residence advisor, I kind of understood that they did. So I would think like, there's all these things that like, if you didn't know, like if you didn't, yeah. you know, you, you know don't what's have so a sibling. You know so funny about or, that? Yeah. Like, because both, <laughs> both of us were RAs at one point, I think, and yeah, both of us yeah. worked in residence. And somehow I can't fathom how a student wouldn't know that, but I can totally relate because I'm sure there were students who lived with me who didn't understand how that all yeah. worked but in my yeah. head like my job was to make them understand so you know you're like how do people not understand that but obviously it happens and yeah, like a case yeah. of point, me I, I, yeah, ha I have exactly. to say like even when I became a residence advisor you know part of your role was to like I mean I, I, I was lucky to work in a system that wasn't very punitive we were very like obviously students are going to have parties how do we make sure that they, they socialize well, like, mm -hmm. and, and safely? And, you know, I would, I would pop into my students' parties to make sure things were going okay, not just to, like, shut it down, but to, like, see how things were going. And, uh, and I remember, like, you know, I, I would always try to be conscious of, like, telling students, like, who I was and what I did. Like, you know, right. I'm like, here's my name, and, like, and why am I here? Because 
I was definitely on the receiving end of like that. I'm like, there's just a rando here. Um, and I don't know why. I like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And as much as possible, you want to try and make it a learning experience for them instead of like, mm-hmm. you're, you know, the big bad police that have to come and shut them down from having a good time. Oh yeah, totally. I mean, they, it, that, that's, that's not the goal at all. Right. Like, of I mean, course. obviously if it gets to a place where it's impacting others, like you have a responsibility to manage the community, but at the same time, you really, you're, you're there to like, I, I think the analogy we always use is like a big sister, big brother kind of thing. Right. Like you're not there as a parent, yeah, but like yeah, exactly. as a guide to be like, you know, this is, this is how things work. And, and, you know, you know, if you have a little sibling and they're out of line with your other little sibling, you call them out on it. Right. Like that's, oh, yeah. that's what you do. But I so, and, Oh yeah. I remember one time my Don, because uh, we called them Dons at, at Laurier, mm-hmm. um, my roommate called, he said he thought of him as a father figure, and my Don was like devastated. He didn't want to <laughs> be a father figure, he wanted to be the helpful older brother, exactly what you're describing. I, I totally get that. I am um, with my students. Um, I used to like, you know, the students being like my students being those who lived in my community when I was a residence advisor. Um, I would, I would bake them cookies and, and drop off care packages at their unit and things like that. And they, they ended up calling me like, like their mama bear. And I'm like, Oh man, that's what I wasn't going for either. But right, right, at right. the same time, I'm like, I, when I, when I was offended by it, I remember like being like, Oh, like, and then like, you know, my students were like, you know, I miss my parents. Like I feel cared for like, uh, yeah. and, I, and, and I was like, Oh, you know what? Like I can embrace that. Like care is an important element too. It's not just like guidance, but care. Right. Sure. And yeah. I guess that just goes to show that every student is kind of either looking for something different out of the mm-hmm. experience or getting something different out of the experience. Oh, totally. So I, yeah, again, like, I mean, so I've been, uh, I've been doing some first year transition, you know, support for a lot, like a yeah, long time yeah. or long in my life now. Um, and uh, I think, you know, the really what I, I hope to help students navigate difficulties, again, not eradicate, like, you know, again, such as life. And we want to equip people to be able to know how to, to navigate transitions because there will certainly be more. Mm-hmm. But the when I talk about hidden curriculum, I think there's an element sometimes that we forget about when we're supporting students is that like there are a lot of things that like you wouldn't necessarily you don't necessarily know. There's like a culture and like and hidden components right. that um, that you have to uh, explicate, right? Like so oftentimes we'll be like, yeah, you're having trouble with your academics. You should go to A and C C. Okay, so what's A and C C? Um, like, what does it mean to go to A and C C? Like, That's do right. I like phone it in? Do I go drop in? Do I send them an email? Like, and like, and, and like, you know, and trying to like unpack like what are those components that maybe we just like, there are the assumptions in and how we yeah. like, navigate transition. Yeah. Um, so trying to to, to to navigate that and and then I, I guess I, lastly the I, I want students to feel a sense of community when they're here. Um, that's yeah, that's really my right. goal is that they navigate the transition and and kind of and learn to like understand how the system works, um, but mm-hmm. then also feel like they're actually a part of the system and part of the community as well. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the value in, in that programming like yours exists as the year goes on too is that orientation week can be an overwhelming experience and there's so much information getting thrown at them so fast and like we can't expect students to remember everything they hear in the first three or five days they're on campus so to have uh you know peer mentors and things like that people they can speak to throughout the year to ask questions to it's a much more non-threatening much more accessible way for students to get the information they need yeah, totally. And then, I don't know, it, like, that, I feel like this episode is going to be like, walk down like memory lane for Rebecca. But right, I, 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 yeah, I feel like what makes me gravitate to first year too is that like, again, that I, I didn't like it. I have so much trauma um, and not like to you know, misuse or to minimize literally, I, I, you know, the very significant moments of my life from first year. Um, but then also like, just like, like, you know, negative impressions when I first arriving. Um, you know, I went to U of T and I, I, I loved my experience in the end, but I was quite intimidated when I first arrived, you know, like, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes, especially like from a first generation lens, like feeling like maybe you don't belong or, you know, you, it's hard for you to talk to your parents about things, you know, you're trying to learn about how everything works without the support of your parents. But then I, I think there is like a, a feeling too of like when you're at like a prestigious university like U of T and you know, all your classmates are so smart, like, it, like, am I smart enough to be here? Am I, like, 
Um, and I was in uh, uh, commerce at the time. I was in management. Um, so shout out to all the management folks who are working hard to, you know, to stay in their programs and to, and to keep going because uh, it's difficult. Um, and I and it was it wasn't a good fit for me. Um, but I remember like arriving again uh, for orientation, and the first thing that we did was we got into our groups and started cheering, and then we had to go to the different colleges and cheer at each other. And that's when I left. I was like, I I'm not cheering, yeah, that's and I'm not, not like, for what am I? everyone. Yeah, yeah. I was like, I'm like, why, why, and why would I? And at the time, I get, you know, because only ten years ago, but and, and the universities worked really hard to move away from this. You know, the cheers were offensive. Oh, like, yeah, uh, and I was like, man, I don't want to be saying these things to people. And a lot of my high school friends were going to U of T, so we just left together. We were like, okay, like let's just go hang out at each other's house and like and skip orientation. In retrospect, it, like, and you know, and, and actually, like even for management, we had our whole a whole other orientation. But I, I, I had to work to like to go to school, so I couldn't take a weekend off work to go to an orientation. I had to, right. like, I had to work. And you know, in retrospect, those were pieces that probably would have helped with my transition. But um, I really didn't connect with it. So I, I don't. I, again, like for for me, my lens of coming into this role is like I don't really connect with the traditional programming. How do we support students who maybe don't either? Well, like not getting rid of it, but like how do we create more inclusive, open programming? Yeah. yeah. I think we could do a whole episode of this down the line and just gather a bunch of people who want to talk about orientation and talk about yeah. what should be part of orientation and what shouldn't be because like I could go on for hours about that. So, um, <laughs> and now it makes me think too, what you said, I'm going to take a tally as I do these, these uh, podcasts of all the people who had a tough first year. And if they're, if that's why they're working in uh, their field of work now, mm -hmm. I actually had a similar experience to you, I would say. And so oh, I wonder yeah. if that's how I ended up in the job I'm in now. But uh, yeah. I guess, Tell me more, Jonathan. I, I guess <laughs> we'll never know. The interviewer becomes... <laughs> yeah. I, well, you know what? We'll have to do another episode down the line. <laughs> where I'll be interviewed. Um, I wanted to ask about with the programming that you do, do you find, you know, specific to first-year students, there's very common uh, things that come up between students that they similar, you know, questions that are getting asked quite often of your, um, of your work study students, uh, similar fears that students have or um, mm. concerns. And is it like, is it one thing in September and it changes to something entirely in March? Yeah. Um, I think things happen at different points throughout the year. Um, I, I think we have to recognize the individual that while we, you know, while we think there's a student life cycle, um, you know, in September, students are going to be worried about making friends and October, they're going to be worried about midterms. It's like that, that's fairly common. And I think we can expect from most students. I think students come in at different points as well, too, like their consciousness or like their understanding of what they need might be different at different times. Like, you know, again, like me, I, I can only use myself as an example of like my, myself, like in the first month, I wasn't really worried uh i was having a good time yeah. um but it, it was a little while before you came figure back. out how difficult yeah. It, yes exactly. yeah and, and and similarly you know i i support students all the time and uh, and especially my previous role working on residents as the residence life coordinator my role was a lot of like mental health and um you know criti like critical incident response um and you know when you're supporting students like, who are going through tough times like you see that um like, you know, that maybe like, like for one person, it was because something happened at home, um, like at a different point in the year. And then for others, like first semester was going super well. And then homesickness hit in January, you know, they went home for the break and now they're back and mm -hmm. homesick. So um, I, I guess what I mean to say is that like, I guess there are maybe some common patterns that we can identify during the year, but it's very individualistic too. And um, I get, I mean, bringing it back to the programming with the peer advisors, we, we try, the whole system is so that depending on like where you're at in the year, you have a, like you have support. So we don't just do the, like the orientation model is we're going to front load you with support in late August, early September and like check mark you're ready. Um, yes. But for many of us, there's like, you know, we have like, we're complex beings, right? Like, 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 you know, I think uh, intersections of like different identities, lived experiences, and that's going to shape how we like how we experience our first year of university. Um, so having like an open opportunity to connect with someone at any point during the year is really like the model that we're going for. Mm -hmm. um, but again, generally, I would say like, I mean, some of the major concerns that we see for students is like homesickness, like friendship building, like relationships, there's a lot of loneliness on campus. Um, and I think that's, you know, because we often focus on like, maybe like academic challenges, like surface level challenges. 
but they're like, this is a critical point of identity for a lot of us too. Like you're maybe living away from home for the first time and yeah. your values conflict with your parents for the first time. Um, it, like, you know, and you're really coming into being who you are and that's kind of its own, its own struggle, right? Mm-hmm. While also being in a new environment. And sometimes it's freedom for the first time in an, in an unparalleled way for a lot of students and having to navigate what that's like. It, it oh, actually, totally. I was thinking about that at the beginning when you said you wanted to live on campus so that you could like wake up for classes. And I yeah. thought like, I wonder if being, having no one else there to wake you up in the morning actually was a hindrance or uh, did you make it to class on time? You know what? I actually think I did a little bit better than high school. Like okay, <laughs> in high right. school, I uh, I went to high school a town in a different town than I lived in, so I had to catch an earlier bus. That was part of the problem. Um, and I, I guess like I, I like well, I don't know. I, I'm gonna be honest. There are some classes I didn't make it to. Uh, but Nobody's the, the val- yeah, no one's perfect. No one. But you learn pretty quickly. Like schedule your classes around like if you can. The, like you know the type of person that you are like I had 9 a.m. calculus in in first year and that was horrible um so you know I, I think I learned to like schedule more afternoon classes because that worked better for me mm-hmm. um you know mm-hmm. <laughs> versus the early morning stuff I but think those that are works things, for a lot yeah. of students better yeah <laughs> I don't have a lot of students requesting to meet with me at 9 a.m. I'll tell you that oh I used to work with someone who be that we would do discipline so like you know if you violated the, right. like the code of conduct at the university you know what what like there was a disciplinary component and i i knew someone who always scheduled his for like 8 a.m and he was like and i was like man like that's the punishment in and of itself yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely um you know so it's interesting you brought up like some of the challenges that students experience and part of the reason we started the the way that this podcast came up is because there is a brand new challenge facing all of us right now, which is COVID-19. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. uh, you and me, for example, we're doing this over Zoom, which is kind of like Skype because we're not in the office right now. We're working from home and most students are taking online classes right now. And so um, how has COVID-19 affected the programming that you're able to do at the moment uh, for students? Yeah, well, I think first and foremost, it changes the needs, right? Like, I think if we were following our, t- our typical model, um, this would be the time of year where we're like wrapping up the year, you know, we want to make meaning of everybody's experiences, like bring closure to, to their first year experience and support them and do exams. But this is like, there's a totally different need right now of like, I, you know, this is my first year of university, I've never done an April exam season. And now I have to do this April exam season with a lot of uncertainty, you know, maybe online with technology that I haven't used before, with technology that's not available to me. You know, I think we make a lot of assumptions about what technology students come with and like what um, networking capabilities they come with. So that in itself is already a challenge. Um, You know, what we've tried to do is uh, shift our framework to uh, to more of a virtual um, platform, which although to be honest, like with the peer advising model, it is, it's already electronic, you know, it's via email, Mm-hmm. Um, some of those components were already kind of set up and the first year peer advisors are, you know, they're set up so that the moment you're admitted to U of T, you're connected to them and then it right to the end of your school year. So luckily that was already in place, but we've, um, we've tried to use platforms like Zoom to offer, you know, virtual socials where students can come together as a community, like watching movies, playing video games. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, our virtual cafes are one where, you know, we'll bring a, a like a topic, like how to study from home and then a question period. So um, I, I, again, like, I guess what's shifted is really what students need right now. Um, mm-hmm. and, and th- what's also shifted is the, like the medium for which we offer that to students. So, um, yeah, whereas we would probably offer like exam jam in the meeting place, uh, the title of the podcast, right. <laughs> um, but, uh, and like now it's, you know, we're talking about, do we do like exam jam all day live stream? of different activities that students can do or a resource they can access to help them through an exam. So that's, that's a little bit what's shifted for us. Although mm-hmm. I got to tell you, I'm pretty excited. Like um, maybe someone who has like loved, um, you know, when it, like a new app update happens and there's a new feature on your phone or, you know, Microsoft comes out with a suite of products. Um, I, I'm excited to see what this might mean for, for U of T and our, you know, our community to see how we can, like digitize some of our programming yeah, like yeah. 
Yeah, like even- You're definitely being forced into trying some new things. And I think some of that's going to stick and some of it we're going to be able to use after we kind of all get through this. Yeah, like, I I mean, something I'm always pretty conscious of, like year to year is the most captive audience um, and the audience that probably needs the most support is the incoming first year audience. So they haven't set foot on campus yet, but they have been admitted and they're ready to start. Um, They're like, they're ready for information. Like, why wait till orientation? That, that that's a good time to like be sharing resources and building community. Mm-hmm. Like you know, I, I I knew a few people in undergrad who met on Facebook, um, and then they agreed that they would meet each other for the first day of classes, and they were best friends ever since. And obviously, that's not the story for everyone, but mm-hmm. um, I really what I'm excited about too is that with like remote community building and remote programming, it gives us the opportunity to, I think, actually build a better sense of community and to offer more services to students who are coming into the university. Um, And maybe like even some of the access programming that we do to high school students um, or like, you know, students around the world, I think we could be a little bit, we can be even more responsive um, like through these mediums. So I'm I'm, I'm pretty excited. Um, Although, of course, my heart goes out to, I can't imagine this being my first year experience, right? Like mm-hmm. with all the challenges you've experienced and then, you know, like you're in the home stretch and now you're literally home now. Yeah. Um, like you, you're actually in the home stretch, but still kind of at school trying to get everything done. So sure. it's like, it's like another transition and another environment. Like, like, you know, you just kind of got through one. So um, I feel for first year students right now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm also thinking about, graduating students and the fact that their last class is kind of just one day they were going to class and the next day they're not and they might never go to another class again in person and so how wild yeah. an experience that must be to know that you've got some online lectures to finish up over the next couple yeah. weeks but you're not going to sit in that lecture hall again maybe which is I don't know about you Jonathan thing. but I remember when I was graduating from my undergrad like like I, I needed those last two months to like fulfill my bucket list and like yeah, kind of list of yeah. things I want to do before I left. And like, uh, you know, I, I, I was a residence advisor, like, you know, and I remember doing my last on-call shift and walking through the building and uh, you know, it, it, it was like a bittersweet moment. Um, and I, I, I hear you. I think a lot of people were kind of robbed of that opportunity now to like really say goodbye to what's probably been a pretty significant period of their lives so far. Mm-hmm, uh, for sure. Um, well, and so with, with COVID-19, the other thing I wanted to ask about was how are you doing working from home? How has that transition been for you? And, you know, what what have you been doing to kind of force yourself to not be sitting at a desk all day and just working since, you know, there's it's much harder to separate. I, personally, I've been finding that it's way harder to separate when you're working versus when you're not working because you're not necessarily leaving your your house or a condo or apartment during the day. Yeah. Oh, I have to admit, like, um, when I worked on residence, I was on call 24 seven, and I lived where I worked. So that was good training ground. I I was there for five years. And that really helped me to to understand what it's like to live where you work. But at the same time, like, I wasn't really bringing my my, my home, my my work into my home every day. So it's been a bit of a journey. Um, Like, so I think, you know, March 13th was really when we started to get the advisories, like the travel advisory, like, you know, I I think when uh, things really started to change for the COVID spread in Canada, specifically in Ontario, um, that was actually a day I was planning to travel to Vancouver to visit my nephew and my my brother-in-law and sister-in-law. The unfortunate thing, um, fortunate, unfortunate, I haven't really figured it out, I guess, is that um, for me, uh, I, I have some health issues that make me vulnerable and I'm immunocompromised. Mm-hmm. So I know my, my partner, we were like, do we go to Vancouver because there's a little bit of a risk, for, more of a risk for me. Um, and if I get sick, it's quite dangerous. So we, we really, you know, like, I think it was like the, the night before we were supposed to be leaving and we were seeing everything. We're like, you know what, let's cancel. Let's, let's, let's not go on the trip. And then boom, the next day, like every, you know, everybody's home. Um, or I guess maybe a couple days later. So we've been self-isolating since like March 12th. Um, we, we were like, you know, I, we were extra worried about me. So I come from the perspective of someone who's been like self-isolating for like nearly two weeks now. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, um, I, I think there's like a bit of like a, you know, a wave, like the first, like the first part is like, yes, I'm home. If you're like me, like I love being at home and um, I could be in my pajamas all day and just Netflix all day and have a really good time. 
Um, but that like that poses challenges, right? Like for like, how do you, how do you shift mindsets? So, um, I think there's been some ups and downs. Like, uh, I think personally, especially coming from like an immunocompromised perspective, I've, I've been a little bit afraid to go outside. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think I've actually been happy being inside my apartment because it, like, I feel kind of safe here. Like, uh, I, like versus like when I'm out and about, like, I don't go to the grocery store. My partner goes for me. I walk my dog. That's, that's basically what I do. Um, although this morning my dog and I encountered a coyote. So, well, we're going to have to reevaluate yeah. some of so uh, maybe like take a different route. path yeah. next time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah sure. No more coyote paths anyway. No, no. <laughs> um, but um, like I, so I think for many of us, there's that complexity too, of like even navigating like, like your sense of safety um, and like, and what this means for your reality now. Right. Like, I start yeah. to think like, I, I guess, maybe, I don't know if this is like too heavy for what we're going for, but like, I like feeling afraid to go outside because I might get sick or what if this is like fatal for me or, you know, like what, like, what's my, what's my employment going to look like in six months? Like, yeah, yeah. It's like I like it, it's, it's been a little bit frightening, um, but I've appreciated having the opportunity to work from home where I can like focus on things at the same time too. So I don't know, like, um, it, it's been good for me in the sense that like having like a dog, I have to like, I have to keep some sort of routine. Like, like, like she's going to want to get, she, she needs walks. She needs to be fed. Um, and it's kept me actually on routine too. So I don't know what I would do if I didn't have my dog. Um, but, uh, I like keeping a routine and trying to keep life as normal as possible has been, has been really helpful for me. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's good that, you know, I'm glad you're willing to talk about that kind of stuff because I think there's all kinds of people going through all sorts of weird experiences right now. People aren't used to yeah. isolating the way everyone has to right now. And so um, I'm sure a lot of people have a story like that about how they, like, they're, what if they go outside? Or a lot of people are living with mm. uh, elderly family members and they're worried about what if they get sick and they bring it back in their house. So I think it's good that, you know, we're, talking about things like that because that is the reality the reality is we're all not at utsc which is our workplace our home where we study uh we can't be there right now not all the time anyway and so um how's everybody coping with that i think it's worth talking about so yeah um, and like and acknowledging the feelings that go with it too like i have to say like um i mean again i've loved being home i've been having a good time but i i, I think something i've had to like manage for myself was like watching the news all day like it makes me afraid like like that's what like fear is definitely something i've been experiencing but i have to say like you know i like you know you see like people online who are are not so like social distancing or physical distancing Mm -hmm. and 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 i've had to like temper my feelings of like sometimes anger because for me i'm like man like this could really impact my life like for me like i could be like i could die um, you know, my, my sister runs a small business, like the longer this goes on, the, like the harder this is for her business. And, um, you know, and, and I, like, I've had to like manage some of those feelings about like, how, like, like, uh, like, how, like feeling upset about how everybody's responding to this, but at the same time, also feeling really proud of like our system and, um, and the people who have like come together to make sure that we are effectively addressing coronavirus as well. So it's an emotional mm-hmm. roller coaster, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to talk today. Uh, and hopefully we're all back on campus soon and uh, we can get back to doing our regular work. Yeah. If not, meet us on Zoom. You know, I guess that's, that's a, right. <laughs> uh, tonight, we have a new office space now. You know? That's right. And Becky's hosting your, your video game streaming uh, event tonight. So yeah. um, hope you all like Terraria. <laughs> yeah. I'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Until all next right. time. Uh, Thanks so much for having me on the meeting place. (laughs) No problem.